Hello everyone. Hello my darling. How are we doing today? How are we doing today? How are we doing today? Please tell me where you're joining from. Let me get to know you. Our broadcast will start at, you know, 10 minutes past, you know, 8. You know, but I mean, the real teaching, I want to get to know you. Um, you can introduce to me where you are, you know, watching from, what your name is, where you're watching from. If you have a testimony, if you have a question from um, um, Next Level Prayers, you can go ahead and ask. I would love to get to know you at this time. Um, yes, Ford Brownie. Joining from Ireland, Fudge Brownie, it's nice to meet you. And from Maryland, Ebony T07, really nice. Um, Ayiko from Scotland, really nice. Um, Arita from Ayobo, really nice. Mix Abana, really nice to meet you. From Kenya, Bella Gankia, really nice to meet you. From Kenya, Banji from Lagos, nice to meet you. Ikeja, Yatu from Ikeja. Another total, total upper from Maryland. Where in Maryland? Are you in Silver Spring? Are you in Bowie? Are you, um, are you in Laurel? Watching from Ghana, really nice, really nice. Watching from Germany, Pet Guala. Okay, watching from Jaws, really nice. Bolani watching from Lagos, really nice. Joining from Adamawa State, really nice. Bams from London. Hey, London people, it's nice to see you. Blessings from Abuja. Jua from Lagos. Ejoke from Delta, Ole Delta. Joining from Canada, Bemiliki Adioti, it's really nice to see you. Or you're being paid from UK. It's nice to see you. Remy from London. It's really nice to see you also. Where are you joining from? If you have a testimony from Next Level. From Finland. It's really nice to see you from Finland. You have a testimony from Next Level. You have an experience you want to share. You have a question about today. It would be good to just let know that on time. Oh, From China. Oh, wow. I am the victor from China. Joyous from Ikeja Jerry. Folake from London, that's really good. Watching from Paris, that's really good. It's a pleasure to meet you. It's a pleasure to meet you. And some of you have been asking for the opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, you know, I'm really looking into that and the schedule that we have to be able to that. From Turkey, official Vera from Turkey. It's really nice to meet you. From Surrey, I love Surrey. Surrey in England, really nice to meet you. From Anambra, really nice to meet you. Tara from Lagos, Undo. Oh, Wisconsin, how cold is it right now in Wisconsin, the US? I can imagine how cold it is right now. Precious watching from Ab Abuja, from Ghana. How is Ghana? What part of Ghana is he? Accra is he? You know, um, from Saudi Arabia. Oh, wow. How is Saudi Arabia right now? From, oh, from the UK, from Texas in the UK. That's really nice. My testimonies are never read. Shewa from Dubai. Shewa, we'll, we'll read your testimony. Send them again. Tinoke from Manchester. And this is Mary from Canada. Really good. Really, really good. Really good. I hope we're doing so well. Someone says I have a question. Don't just say you have a question. Type your question. Type your question. Type your question. I, I hope we can in future they be able to talk with people and, you know, and just be able to take it from there. From Ghana, specifically Tema. Tema, yeah, from Tema. Wonderful. How is Tema doing today? Is he hot? Another person from Ghana, from Accra. It's really nice. From the Philippines. It's welcome. You're welcome from the Philippines. So I'll say from Fulham in London. I don't know where Fulham is in London. Is it London, London? Where is Fulham? What is he close to? Is he close to Edgeware? What is it? What line is he on? Is it in London, London or, it's, or the outskirts of London? Ade Olaf from Ondibongbo. It's really nice to see you. And someone says from Vietnam. Oh, wow. I've never seen anybody contact me from Vietnam. I've read so much about Vietnam. And, uh, you know, Yes, California, from California. It's nice. What part of California? <laughs> San Antonio, Los Angeles, uh, Malay. What part of California? T.Y. from Warri. Uh, Paul from Illinois. I love Illinois. I love Illinois. Ayobami from Lagos. I love Ayobami from Lagos. Houston, Texas. How are you doing? So from the UAE. All my UAE family, really nice to see you. From not Cyprus. Wonderful. All of you from Texas, we're praying for you. And I hope that it's getting better and better and better. And this hour from Senegal, from Dakar, Senegal, really good. From K2, you know, really good. And from South Africa, where asked my South African? Uh, Tree Dida, 
Will you contact all my South African friends and let them know that we're alive? I love Johannes, but what part of South Africa are you from? From Baltimore. Oh my God. Baltimore, Maryland. Baltimore is a very nice place in Maryland. You know, um, so Baltimore, Maryland is very, very nice. That's what I meant to say. You know, I, I love, I miss dancing in front of church. We also miss it. New Jersey. New Jersey is a very good place. Abuja. What advice do you give to single ladies with dating during the pandemic as well? There's a lockdown. Okay. Let me kind of write that down. Someone says, what advice do you give to single ladies? Um, from Birmingham. Oh, that's really nice. From from Mildred from Lagos. Awesome. Takwaradi. One of my friends stays in that part of, you know, talks about that part of town in Ghana. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. I'm just going to post from Canada. Where are all my Canadian friends today? Where are all my Canadian friends today? Nancy from Lagos, Olamide from Lagos. Okay, let's get to it today. All right. So today, um, if you want to invite your friends to join, basically, we're talking about two key things. The first thing I want to talk about today is this. I want to talk about, um, one, hearing the voice of God, but I want to apply it when it comes to marriage. I want to apply it when it comes to marriage. So this is what people would always say. So you hear, I've heard a lot of things like the, my prophet said we should not marry. You know, my prophet said we should not marry. My parents prophet said we should not marry this. And one prophet said this. Or you have someone that is really bold that comes up to you and says that God said that um, I should marry you. And, you know, when someone says that God says I should marry you, you go like, what options do I have? I, I mean, if I want to obey God, then that's what it's going to be. So this will be very good. This will be very good. So if you have questions about hearing God's word, about choosing who to marry, about knowing who to marry, this is a good time for you. If you want to invite your friends, this is a good time to tag them, share them, give them a call on the phone. And uh, someone says, Pastor, please, I cannot hear you. I want to make sure. Someone say, Pastor, you can, I can hear you. I, I hope you can because every other person seems to respond in so well to my discussion. All right, so let's start with this. So the first thing I want to speak about is just to backtrack a little and talk about why is it very difficult for people to hear the voice of God? Why is it very difficult for people to hear the voice of God? Number one, wrong teaching, wrong teaching will affect your ability to hear the voice of God. Someone says, how is that possible? Once you're taught wrong, you will believe wrong. Once you believe wrong, you will experience wrong. And one of the foundational problems I see with Christianity is that people are taught wrong. And because people are taught wrong, they believe wrong. And because they believe wrong, they experience wrong. For example, some teaching says it's only the pastors and the prophet that can hear God, that you cannot hear God yourself. This is my, this is my answer to you all. God does not have, God does not have grandchildren. We are all sons of God and have equal access to God. So you don't have to be a pastor, a prophet, or a teacher to hear God. This is what the Bible says. It says, my sheep hear my voice and they know it. It didn't say the pastors. It didn't say the prophets. It says, my sheep hear my voice and they know it. So the reason why some people don't hear God is wrong teaching. And this I've been talking about for a couple of weeks right now. Some people don't hear the voice of God because they have been told. What have they been told? They have been told that um, if you sin, God will stop talking to you. And I said, that's religious nonsense. It's not biblical. So I took it from Genesis. I said, number one, when Adam and Eve sinned, did Adam and Eve, Eve hear the voice of God or not? They did because the Bible says God came to them in the cool of the evening. Number two, when Cain sinned, did God talk to, to, did God talk to Cain or not? God did. God spoke to Cain, you know, and on and on and on. When David sinned, God spoke to David. I don't know why religious people, not Christian people, keep teaching us and saying that when you sin, God will stop talking to you. And listen to me, once you believe that, then you experience that because what you believe becomes what you experience. What you believe becomes what you experience. The second reason why people don't hear the voice of God is this. They lack faith in themselves to hear the word of God, to hear the voice of God. They lack faith. So one of the things I see is this. It's not as if people can't hear the voice of God. They just really believe that when it comes to them, because 
They keep looking at themselves through their weaknesses, through their own issues, and they're not able to see differently. They just look at themselves through their own weaknesses. So, you know, they have this lack of faith in themselves. And let me say something to you. If you have a lack of faith in your own faith, you will struggle as a Christian. You will not believe when you hear the voice of God. You will not believe when God speaks to you. You will not believe in your own prayer. You will have to always lean on somebody else's experience. And the simple truth is this, because you don't have faith in your faith. And a lot of Christianity around today puts a lot of faith in a speaker, in a preacher, in somebody else apart from themselves. The third reason why people don't hear the voice of God is this, because of a lack of training. So the Bible says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. He says, he says, concerning spiritual, or the Greek word is nomatikos. It says, concerning spiritual, I will not have you ignorant. So the question is this, why did the apostle say, concerning spiritual things, I will not have you ignorant? Number one, because in, in, in the spiritual world, the way there is manifestation and activation, how is there manifestation and activation? By knowledge. In the realm of the spirit, you can only take advantage of what you can only take advantage by knowing. The man that has and does not know is equal to the man that has not in the spirit realm. The man that has and does not know is equivalent to the man that does not have. So if you know, if you have something in the spirit realm, you must know. That's why some of the biggest prayer of Apostle Paul. One of the biggest prayers of Apostle Paul is this, that God will reveal to you. Revelation does not mean God gives you something. It's an unveiling. So in the play, what Revelation does is this. In Revelation, there is an unveiling. That means that that thing is present. So the word revelation in the Greek means apocalypsis. It means that it's unveiled. It's opened up. So in Revelation, why does God open up things to us? You cannot take advantage of what you do not know. And that's why the most powerful Christians don't just pray. The most powerful Christians give a lot of attention to Bible study. You know why? What is revealed in Bible study, they take advantage of in prayer. That's why what is revealed in Bible study, you take advantage of it in prayer. What is revealed in Bible study, you take advantage of it in prayer. When you see a Christian that does not read the Bible, there will be nothing he will be able to take advantage of in prayer. The fourth reason why people don't hear God, so the lack of training. And you see that clearly in the case of Samuel. The Bible says God called Samuel and Samuel went to meet Eli. And God called Samuel and Samuel went to Eli. Until Samuel got a crash course in hearing and discerning the voice of the Spirit, he could not pick that that was the voice of the Spirit. It couldn't pick that that was the voice of the Spirit. So once it got a crash course and he understood that this is God speaking to me, you know what happened? He was able to hear clearly what God is saying. The fourth reason why people don't understand or discern the voice of God is this, because they are distracted. When people are distracted, so the good case is, the, is a prophet, Balaam and Balak. The Bible says an angel was, was raising up the sword and he was not able to see it. He was not able to see it. The Bible speaks of Jacob, that Jacob was in a certain place. He was troubled. His mind was troubled. And let me tell you something. Some of you are praying about a business decision. You are praying about a job decision. Your mind is really extremely troubled. But the reason why you cannot see is because what you are really distracted. Your emotions and distracted. This is what the Bible says in the book of Isaiah. It says, in quietness and confidence shall your strength be. That means that it is the place of quietness. It's in the place of deep assurance. You are going to hear the word of the voice of God well up in your spirit. You are going to hear the voice of God well up in your spirit. In quietness and confidence shall your strength be. What I've noticed over time is this. When a Christian is perplexed, when a Christian is anxious, when a Christian is angry, distracted, you know, in a hurry, you may not be able to hear the voice of God accurately. But once you are able to find 
mind and calm your emotions. What will happen is that in that place, the voice of God will flow unhindered and uninterrupted. So some people can hear the voice of God because they are distracted with their emotions. And that's why, let's say you are praying about marriage and you want to marry someone. You know, one of the things I would suggest that detach from the people you like for a season and begin to pray about who to marry. And the reason is simple. You can't keep talking with that guy or that girl every day. You guys are sending all those lovely text messages and you say, Lord, is it your will or not? Your emotions are so tied up, it can begin to distract you. Please, all of you sending questions, you have to hold on right now. I cannot read your question. If you want me to answer your question, you have to send it later. Your emotions are so tied up, you cannot really, you know, you cannot really at that point. You know, you want to, there's a way you soak yourself into a business decision. You soak yourself into, I want to migrate, you soak yourself. And I say, God, is your will. There's a, and there's an amount of emotional attachment that becomes destructive. And that's why when Jesus was going to go to the cross, he said this is not my will. He had to come to a point and to pray the prayer of a consecration. Say that, Lord, leave everything, not my will, but yours alone be done. Not my will, but yours alone be done. So another reason why people don't hear the voice of God is that they are very, very distracted. So if you are distracted, one of the things you have to do is to look away from those distractions. Look away from those distractions. Another reason why people don't hear the voice of God is this, because of the hardness of heart. That's how the Bible describes the state of the children of Israel. The Bible says that they had the hardness of heart. What is the hardness of heart? They are perspective, they are dispositions, they are perspective that they are unwilling to alter. It is the hardness of heart. You know, so they are praying in their heart that God, please show me your will. They are praying in their heart that God, please tell me what you want to do. But deep down with him, they are hell bent on what they want to do. They are saying, Lord, please, should I migrate or not? But deep down with him, they've concluded. That whatever happens, I'm leaving Nigeria, I'm leaving Ghana, I'm leaving the UK. They, they've concluded in their hearts. You know, in fact, what they say is that, Lord, I know you are not happy with it, but please forget that and just bless it. The Bible speaks about the hardness of heart. The hardness of heart is a state where you get to. And you know what? You know, your heart just becomes hard towards what is the will of God because there's an existing disposition. There's an existing path or pattern you want to take. So that speaks about the hardness of heart. When you have hardness of heart, you will not be able to clearly see the will of God and the patterns of the Spirit of God unfold in your life. For example, the Bible says this, that Jesus Christ looked at Judas Iscariot and he told him that what you want to do, go and do quickly. I thought for a moment Jesus, Judas Iscariot would back down and be like, my God, the Messiah knows I'm going to, what do they call it, I'm going to what? Betray him. For him to know that and say I should do it quickly, that means that I'm on the wrong path. But his heart was so hardened, he couldn't see it. When people have hardness of heart, let me tell you what begins to happen. They even begin to interpret God's guidance in a way to support what is wrong. So you will see something. So Judas will have said something like, ah, he even said, whatsoever you do, do quickly. What does that mean? He wants me to betray him. So when people have hardness of heart and someone comes and is preaching and God says, you know, and God says something, they will find a way to turn that leading, that guidance to support exactly what they are doing. And deep down in their heart, they know, they know the truth, but they're not just willing to say, um, to align with it. So let's go back quickly into this so that we can go into some question. So someone says, um, um, someone says this, what about if God, so God says that I should, if someone comes to me and this person comes to me and says that God said I should marry you. Let me say something quickly here about marriage and prophecy. Number one, when you read the Bible, the first question you want to ask is this. And people always ask me this all the time. People say, does God have someone particularly for me? This is the, there's no way in the scriptures that says that God has someone, but just one person for you. God plans for you, but I don't believe that God has one person for you. And the reason why is this, even God in his own plan, people change and fail him. 
and God has a replacement strategy. So means so much so that God has a series of events that will lead to different people standing up. I don't believe that you have a God ordained person from heaven. I believe that everybody has someone they can marry and spend their whole time with. That's what I really believe. So this song says, How do you know? But the Bible says this that so someone says that this was the person that the rib was taken out of my rib and it was made to be my own. Listen to me. When the rib of Adam was taken, it was a prophetic illustration. What it was, it let me tell you something. Adam and Eve, and let me just let's just get deep a little here. Let's just get deep a little here. Adam and Eve was a type of the church was a type of christ and the church so when god took the rib out of adam and from the woman what was god saying god says in the future that adam is a type of christ that what will happen is this that god will out of christ form a people called the church out of him it will produce a people that is the prophetic message there not that God is taking your rib and following somebody else and all of those kind of things. Marriage is deep. Marriage mirrors Christ and the church. Marriage is deep. Marriage mirrors Christ and the church. So then, so let's go to this. So I don't believe there's no way in the Bible because think about it. If you think in the Bible and say, I have somebody that God said I must marry just this one person. What about if the person marries somebody else? Is it that God will not start going into another, you know, auxiliary or emergency action to fix something? That's not what happens. That's not what happens at all. You know, what happens, you know, God doesn't go into emergency action and start fixing something. No, that's not what happens at all. God's works are finished from the foundations of the earth. God's works are finished from the foundations of the earth. God's works are finished from the foundation of the earth. What about if the person that is your rib died when you were young? What about if he became a junkard or he's not even a Christian? Will God force him? God cannot force someone else to marry you. So, you know, that concept is flawed on many parts. The second thing I want to say is this. Someone says, does God choose for you? God does not choose your partner for you. That's something that I wanted to see. That God does not choose your partner for you. I want to read a scripture to you. And you would you uh, you will see what the Bible says here. You will see what the Bible says here. I want to read the scripture to you. So, does God choose your partner for you? God does not choose your partner for you. In the book of Proverbs. Are you there? Okay, Proverbs chapter 18 in verse 22. Proverbs chapter 18 in verse 22. I wanted to notice that. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 22. See what the Bible says. Bible says, Whosoever findeth a wife, findeth a good thing and obtains favor of the Lord. Did you notice something here? Number one, did you notice that, did you notice that it is, there is a finding if God is choosing for you, you will not need to be finding. He says, whosoever findeth a wife. So there is a finding. God does not choose for you. Let me give you some key reasons why God does not choose for you. Number one, if God chooses for you, then the failure or success of your marriage will be on God. If God chooses who you will marry for you, the failure or success of your marriage will be on God. Number two, if God chooses for you, God has broken is the power of choice and will that he has bequeathed to us as human beings. God has broken it. He has broken the power of choice. Listen to me. God does not even choose salvation for you. How can God choose wife or husband for you? What God does is to provide salvation. What God does is to provide salvation and you make the choice yourself. The most important thing to God is salvation. If he cannot choose and force you to be born again, you think in the will of, in the mind of God, marriage is more important to God that is going to choose and force you to marry somebody. Oh, come on. You can do better than that in your, in your thinking. You know, so 
God does not choose for you. So what does God do for you, Kweli? What God does for you that God grants you guidance. What is guidance? Guidance is different from choosing. Guidance is different from choosing. For example, if you say you are hungry and I said you can go to the kitchen and there's food. Go to the kitchen, there is food. Does not mean choose this kind of food. I've given you guidance. Go to the kitchen, there is food. That's guidance. The Bible says that God will guide us. It guides us by giving us parameters in which we can use to, you know, there are parameters in which we can use to select who to marry. But it doesn't choose for us because God hopes that you will be able to exercise your willpower, your choice. God hopes that you will be able to exercise that. And it's important to God personally. So he doesn't choose for you. And let me say something to you here. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you can read it after now. You know, because someone said that, well, God said I should marry you. That's very powerful. I respect what you have said. You have to just prove it to me. The second thing, I want to, maybe the first thing is this. Do you know the book of 1 Corinthians says that whether there be prophecy, that prophecy will fail. It says, what will outlast prophecy is love. If you are hoping that because you had a wife prophetically, your mind will last. Listen to me. The Bible says that prophecy will come and go. That what will actually, what will actually last is love. Love is going to overshadow and take a long time over prophecy. So some of you say that, well, my, if I, the most confusing one for me is this. When you say your mother's prophet said this, not your husband. Or your mother's prophet said this, your husband. I get really confused. The person that is not in your marriage has the audacity to tell you who you should marry. If you are intelligent and you understand God, you will know that those things don't work that way. That someone that will not be in your marriage tells you that this is your husband and this not your husband. Listen to me. One of the things you must learn is that nobody has that right over your life. You must step out of religious manipulation and spiritual manipulation and begin to step into what God is saying. The second thing is this. Someone says, God, says, God, God gives us husband and wife. I want to ask you a big question. Who in the Bible? Is it Peter? Is it James? Is it John? That did God give a husband or wife? Who did Jesus Christ himself, when he was alive, give a husband or wife? Who did the apostle Elijah, Elisha, give husband or wife? Most of those people had to choose themselves. How come that in these religious days, we are now saying that God chose for me? If you need some clear guidance, if you need someone to pray with you on a decision, that's understandable. But someone you think has the particular right to determine for you who you should marry, who you should not marry, those things are outright nonsense. Those things are not biblical. Those things are extra biblical materials and make no spiritual sense at all. If someone says that God says I should tell you I should marry you, give them the New Testament. Say, show me in the Bible where someone told somebody else to marry. And listen to me. Can God reveal your wife to you or your husband to you? It's possible because I, I, the fact that it's not done does not mean it cannot happen. But let me tell you something there. Eh? Even if God, and this is the way I want to break a balance, reveals that this is your wife to you, let me tell you, 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 with, you, you make the person less human. When you go and meet the person and say, God says you're my wife. If no God spoke to you, do what you have to do. I want to ask you so a question. If God even tells you, let's even assume that God told that this person, this person called Shinene is your wife. You go and tell Shinene, the Lord spoke to me, you are my wife. I want to ask you a question. That's what you did. If God told you that you have a job in Shell, is that how you go to Shell and go and tell them at the gates, I have a job in Shell? Why don't you use the same approach? Why don't you use the same approach? Why don't you use the same approach? I know some people are referring to Rachel and all of those kind of things. All of those questions, please keep for me. In doing the question and answer time, I'm ready for you. I'm going to take it on one by one by one. So, you know, you, you so I say, um, what do you call it? Um, yes, God says you're my wife. Why don't you go to Shell and go after them at the gate? God said, I have a job here. Even if God says you have a job in Chevron or Shell, what do you do? You go to the process of application. You go to a place of discussion and interview until you get that job. The same thing, if you feel impressed in your heart and you feel as because I mean, some people have spectacular 
experience. I love, I, I love the comment. It says, my friend, do the work. That's what you have to do. My friend, do the work. So if God said this is your wife, then go and do the work. Go and meet the lady and, you know, be kind and let her know you and let him know you and discuss some more and discuss some more. Don't use God told me to be this shield you used to bamboozle people, embarrass them and shake them and fall them down and just make them feel as if they have no choice in this whole matter. All right. So we would, um, we would also... Um, look, look at that. Someone says this. Someone says that, um, how do I know that God is directing me? One, anytime God directs you on who to marry, the direction is going to be in alignment with his word. So God cannot direct it to someone else's wife. God cannot direct it to someone else's wife. You know, it, 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 it's going to be in direction with his word. It's going to be in direction with his word. It's going to be in direction with his word. So let me read finally, and I'm, and I'm going to just begin to close this because a lot of people are sending questions and I want to just be able to go into questions. Let's talk about the leading of the Holy Spirit. Good. Someone said, a wife was found for Isaac. I want to ask you a question. Was it God that chose for Isaac or it was, I, it was, the, it was the servant of Abraham that chose for Isaac? Because sometimes we just take this thing. I'm not saying that someone cannot choose for you. But don't let someone say God chose the, that, that's my issue. Don't, it's, it's the manipulative tendency I'm dealing with here. You know, okay? You know, it's the manipulative tendency I'm, I'm dealing with here. So, let's look at First Corinthians and I want us to, to see something. So, someone said to me, and I've had this question. Um, someone said to me, and I've had this question. Say, when, there, um, when there's a prophecy, what should I do? Most times when there's a prophecy, you just kind of like, oh, I've received a prophecy. What came for me? Let me go and sleep. You know, and... Um, and that is far from the truth. That's far from the truth. That's far from the truth. So I, I, want, I want to notice something. You know, I, I want to notice something. First Corinthians chapter 14 in verse, in verse 29. The Bible says in First Corinthians chapter 14 verse 29. Let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. You know, now I want you to notice something here because now we're going into the issue of spiritual guidance. One, he says, because sometimes, sometimes people say, um, um, can someone say that someone prophesied, but the prophecy don't happen? Does that make him a false prophet? Listen to me. If someone prophesy and the prophecy does not happen, it does not make him a false prophet, especially if that is not the pattern. It could be a genuine prophet that made a mistake. It could be a genuine prophet that made a mistake. How do I know that? See 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 29. He says, let prophets speak two or three and let the other judge. If, if there is a reason for a prophet to judge other prophets, that means, what does that mean? That means that the prophet can make a mistake. The reason why the prophet judge another prophet is because the prophet can make a mistake. So you need to know that, and this is a challenge when you don't hear the voice of God for yourself and you just begin to depend on what a prophet is saying. You have to do better than that for yourself. You have to do better than that for yourself. So, you know, it says when the prophet speaks, he said other prophets should be available that can judge exactly what that prophet is saying. That, that's the first thing. So, number one, a genuine prophet can give a prophecy and he misses it. But what you will notice is this. Number one, it will not be a pattern. Number two, that genuine prophet will come to repentance and say, oh, I missed it. Maybe because I was emotionally attached. Maybe I was confused about something. I didn't pray. That kind of thing. The same way a false prophet can give a prophecy that is correct. A false, so the way you determine a prophet is false or genuine is not by just the validity of their prophecy. You discover what is false or genuine by the spirit in which they operate. The Bible speaks of a girl that said accurately, the girl saw Paul and it says that these are the men of God that brought us the way of salvation. She was very, very clear, correct. But Paul with the power of the Holy Ghost discerned. That this girl was speaking by the spirit of divination. She said, come on. This was a demonic power at work. And Paul casted out the demon. 
he cast out the demon not because the prophecy was false, the prophecy was correct, but he understood that the operation of those things were from a demonic place. So the first, so the thing is this: so prophets can make mistakes. Now, once you are given a prophecy, what should you do? Is it all prophecies that come to pass? No, it's not all prophecies that come to pass. Someone says, "Are you serious?" The prophecy for God to the children of Israel was very simple. God told them, I will take you out of the land of Egypt and take you to the promised land. Did God say that to Moses or not? God told Moses that I will take him there. Did Moses enter the promised land? Did the children of Israel enter the promised land? Both Moses and most of the children of Israel entered the promised land. There was a prophecy, but the prophecy did not happen. So the question today is this, why doesn't prophecy happen? When prophecy don't happen, it doesn't mean that God has not spoken. Number one, there are some reasons why prophecy don't happen. And I'm going to start with this and we can take it again. Number one, because the prophecy is not believed. Any prophecy that is not believed does not happen. That's how prophecy works. The Bible says that the man of God said by this time tomorrow that there will be a miracle of supply. And guess what? One man said, how will this happen? And it says, because you have said, you don't believe this, you will see it, but you will not eat of it. For you to experience a prophecy, you must believe the prophecy. Number two, consciousness of the prophecy. Sometimes a prophecy is not immediate. It takes a while. You just living in that consciousness. That's what Paul told Timothy. What did Paul tell Timothy? He said, make warfare according to the prophecy that have gone ahead of you. So prophecy happening is not automatic. That's what I'm saying to you. So he said, make warfare, make warfare. So you write the prophetic word and begin to use the prophecy as weapons in prayer, in declaration. You begin to say, God, this is what you have said and say it over and over and over again. You don't just keep your mouth shut. This is what I say to people always. A short mouth is a short destiny. A short mouth is is a short destiny so you begin to declare the prophecy the third thing why prophecies don't happen is this people do not line up with the actions or the um the pattern that brings about the fulfillment of the prophecy god says to you that made you a very rich man and you choose to become lazy although god has chosen for you to be rich and wealthy you would actually not do well because you have chosen a path in which prophecy can be fulfilled. God said to you that you will have a child and you refuse to sleep with your wife or sleep with your husband. To have that child be difficult because of exactly the things you've said. So these are the number four is the fact that sometimes there is a spiritual force in which wants to contend for your prophecy and you begin to actually deal with such force in prayer. One of the reasons and things we do in this, in the place of prayer, what do we do? We begin to enforce prophecy. In the place of prayers, we begin to enforce prophecy. So let's go back to this issue of God says I should marry you. So if someone says and says, God says I should marry you, just ask the person and say, I respect what you have heard. I respect what you have seen. I respect the things you've said to me. But do you not really... So by saying this, what do you think? Am I going to marry you because God said so? I'm going to marry you because I love you. Because if I marry you because God said so, I will make your life a living hell, even though God said so. But if I marry you because I love you, your life will be full of love, peace, and fulfillment. And let me say something to you. Either you marry because God showed you a vision, or you marry because you love somebody. What makes a marriage work is the amount of work you put into it. Most people think it's about the person you marry. Well, I agree that is a big factor, but the amount of work you put into marriage will make that marriage work. With this, I hope I've been able to be a blessing to you today as we discuss all of these things. So please, you can share your questions and we can, you know, we can begin to talk about it. Let me get some questions and I can pray with you. Let me get some questions. I can pray with you. All right. Any question, please? Someone said we are destined to marry each other. Well, I don't know where that is in the Bible. So I, I, I don't even know what, how to comment on that. I know how I use sweet um yet. Yeah. So how can please how can someone overcome the hardness of heart? Well, it's by you just submitting yourself to God. What is by you submitting yourself to God? And this is what the Bible says: it break up your fallow ground. If you know your heart is heart. You go to God and say, you know what, 
let, let me just let, let this go. You know, let me just let this go. Let me just let this go. Let it go. They come soft towards God. This person said, sir, I'm 31. I notice over time, people will ask my hand in marriage are, are widowers. What is the problem? Well, a, a lot of things, it, it's not, it might not be something spiritual. It might just be because you are older than the average. Because by 31, a lot of the guys are married already. You know, some of them are married, some of them are not married. So it might not be spiritual. It might just be the fact that because of the phase of life and maybe the maturity that you exhibit and the level of life you are in, those are the people that feel it easy to approach you. The younger people feel intimidated, that kind of thing. Someone says, how can I overcome the fear of marriage? The way to deal with fear is to get faith. It's knowledge. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Your fear of marriage is not going by good. It's not, it's not going to go. Your fear of marriage is not going to go. Sorry. Your fear of marriage is not going to go by prayer. Your fear of marriage is not going to go by, you know, um, deliverance. It's going to go by you getting the word of God. You get in the word of God. Someone say, is it normal to be scared of God's will? The only reason why you are scared of God's will is because of bad teaching. It's bad teaching that makes you get scared of God's will. I want to advise everybody here to go to Harvesters TV. I have over 500 messages that is free there. You can listen over and over again. It will be life-changing for you. If you are scared of God's will, it's only because of bad religious teaching. Please, I have a question I need your advice. I'm in my 40s and I, and I, I get to marry someone younger that mean is he sorry um i'm in my 40s and i get to meet a younger person but i'm sorry i don't know understand what your question means you know can one discern who is right for him or her of course of course the fear of marriage is getting yeah of course all right so i'm just taking some questions here how can a bad attitude in that relationship from working out Everybody wants someone to spend their life with. If your attitude is terrible, then people are just going to move away from you. That's what that means, quickly. So, do we tell our parents? So, what do we tell our parents? Always emphasize on going to the prophet to choose who to marry. So, the reason why your parents always tell you to go to the prophet is that over time, they don't respect your spiritual, um, your, your spiritual intelligence. So, before you even come to the place where you want to marry, demonstrate to your parents that you are spiritually matured and intelligent to make decisions that has spiritual input and when it comes to marriage the same way they have trusted you in every other thing they will trust you in that area all right um this person says and just for you to let you know this week we are going to be praying a lot about finances the reason why is that a lot of the single people and the single ladies the major barrier is about finance next level prayer this week will be very powerful it will be very powerful um someone is asking another question he says can marriage be a sacrifice like for example if you have a child out of wedlock and then marry the person because of the child involved i will not advise you to marry someone because you you had a child for the person i will not advise you to do that that might not be the best thing to do someone says uh the guys i meet are either two or one year younger than me but not serious over time that's my question I'm here to meet someone that is my age. Well, I don't know what the question is. Um, someone says, marry a divorcee wrong? It all depends on the circumstances. Is is a conviction in your heart enough to know that it's the right person? A conviction in your heart is not enough. Can a Christian marry a Muslim? The Bible asks us to marry people that we share the same faith together. Can you marry more than one person? In the New Testament, we don't have examples of people marrying more than one person. Finance is a major thing in, in marriage. That's why this week, in the next level prayer, we are believing God that the power of God will destroy needs. There will be enough for you to marry and enjoy your marriage. As a lady, you don't need to marry a guy for money. God will open the door for you. That's why this next week in finances, it's, it's five days of financial wonders. I want you to be full of faith that the Lord will visit you and your family. The question is about sin. We started with, you said, God cannot be old sin. The Bible says God cannot be all sin, but you said we should not let sin hinder us from talking to God. I think you should listen to uh, the person that asked the question. That I, I said, I don't know what you're talking about because you know, I've he I read what you said, but what is happening is that you're thinking, you're thinking into what I said. I would advise you to go back into the recording and watch it again without bias. You understand what I mean. 
um, how can we get the conviction of who to marry? The same way God will lead you on where to live, where to work, what to do, that the same way will lead you on who to marry. If God had not led you in simple things, I don't think marriage is the first thing you should look for, God leading you. Does genotype matter? Of course it does matter. It's just like saying that marrying someone, there are physical things that matter when it comes to marriage. Um, please, can you prescribe books to build your faith for marriage? Okay, I can do that later. No one comes to my head right now. Did God directed Israel on who they should marry and who they should not? Yes, I say God can give you direction. God does not just choose for you. I said so. God gives you direction. God does not just choose for you. How do you know you have met your husband or wife? You need to just go online and see my messages on that. That's a message on its own. Please, can you shed more light on endurance in marriage? Can God tell your partner into ministry without calling you? Can ministry work if you put to proceed? Well, I mean, the truth is that there's no way... Whatever God has called your partner to do will involve you in one way or the other. That's the truth. So, you know, yeah. Someone says that I want to convert him or her after marriage. Well, I didn't know that you're as powerful as God and you have the power to convert somebody. So that's why you want to convert them. There are a lot of people I would like you to convert. There are some things like the, you know, if you have the power to convert people, you can see me. Please don't only convert the person you want to marry. There are some big human beings that I think if you convert them, you know, you have that power, they will, they will do a lot of things. What I'm saying in other words is that I don't think that anybody can really determine that. Yeah. Um, what if a guy is a Christian but is carnal and I'm spiritual? The Bible says you should marry people that are spiritually yoked. It even just says that people that are Christians, you must have the same spiritual um, bandwidth. The same spiritual bandwidth. The same spiritual bandwidth. Okay? Okay? So, um... So I think we can gradually come to the end of today's discussion and I can also pray with you. This is what I normally say about people that want to marry someone hoping they will change. You don't take someone to the altar to alter them. You don't take someone to the A-L-T-A-R to A-L-T-E-R them. You know, we don't take someone says, how do we resolve the issues of tribes and, fam and family against it? Well, I, I mean, it all depends. It all depends, you know. It all depends on how you work it out. You know, um, how do we tell, how do you tell the difference between being led by the Spirit of God and behavioral manipulation? I will need more details on that. All right, can I just pray for you today? Um, I want to say to you about service tomorrow. Service tomorrow, I think I'll be preaching one of the most powerful messages I've preached. I'm preaching about what to do when you're not getting the results you want. I'm talking about the law of believing. It's very profound teaching. If you can make it physically live there, I'll be preaching in the first service in Bagada and I'll be at the Lekki Church, at the Lekki Center also. If you can make it in the Keja Center, Antony Center, Don Powerful, or you want to watch online. All of you that are international audience, watch online. It will be life-changing. And I want to say something that this week I want us to be able... I want, there's a flyer I have, which is, my God is good and kind to me. Please post it on your page. Share with people. My God is good. Because I want that revelation to ring in your mind. That my God is good and kind to me. Let's go ahead and pray. Let's go ahead and pray. Anywhere you are, will you stretch forth one hand towards me? And I will stretch forth my hands towards you and we'll pray together. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I'm praying for your people. That firstly, they will experience a deeper touch of God in their lives. That will make them go to a place of deeper walk in the Holy Ghost. I'm asking in the name of Jesus Christ that everything that is blocking their spiritual perception will be broken. That their spiritual ears and eyes will be at last and activated in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm praying for everyone that has a marital delay. I command the power of delay be broken in the name of Jesus Christ. Everyone that is on this call that has a marital delay, declare right now, I enter into my marital destiny. 
in Jesus' mighty name. I pray for everyone that is sick in their body, that by the power of the Holy Ghost, the healing power of the Lord Jesus Christ will heal you. I pray for the lady that is on the call, that with a huge back pain, be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for that lady that is watching from the U.S., that you'll be healed by the power of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Just before we close, I have just one announcement to make, and I want to say this to the singles. A lot of you are single here, and you are saying that you are delayed, you are delayed, you are delayed. But you are dating people, married men. Listen to me. This is what you are doing. Every time a single person is dating a married man or someone they cannot marry, but they know. You are saying to yourself that, I know that there's no other person than this person. So that's what you are saying. You are, you are actually acting out your faith. You are actually saying to yourself, I know there's no other person to do it than this person. So let me just go for him. So although you are praying and saying I'm single, but your belief, you say, Lord, I'm praying, I'm believing I'm single, and I want someone from you, but your belief is this, there's nobody for me. So this one that is a married man, let me hold him and handicap, and let's keep him there. Let's just hold him and handicap and keep him there. And what you are practicing is cancelling your prayers. What you are pra- I'm saying so because many of you on this call right now, and the Spirit of God showed me what you are saying is casting out your prayers. And I'm speaking to you by the Spirit of God. And you know yourself. I don't want to mention names as I've seen in the Spirit, but that's what. But because you are praying and you are saying that, Lord, give me. I desire someone. I want someone. I want someone. Meanwhile, in practice, you have said to yourself that since nobody will come, this married man likes me. I'm going to get hooked to him. And the reason why you hook to him is because you don't really believe that that person is coming right now. If you find the person, you will leave him. But you doing that, faith is known by works and action. It's known by works and action. You doing that, you have demonstrated your faith and belief that I don't have anybody. Nobody is coming. This married man is here. I take him. I, you know, I stay with him. This relationship is here. And this is going to where I stay there. And I hold on because half in your mind, because half bread is better than none. And God is saying that once you've done that, you have cut away the supply of your resources. Praise God. And I want to say to you, all of you that are single, say every day, morning and evening, God is good and kind to me. I walk into my marital miracle. Get pictures of you in your wedding dress. Put it on your phone. Put it everywhere. Be seeing it to yourself. Keep declaring the word of God. Keep fasting. Keep praying. Keep attending the services. Keep mingling. Don't be tired. Keep sowing your seed and you'll be surprised what the Lord will do. Hallelujah. I love every one of you. And I'm just praying. I can't wait to have your testimonies. If you have a testimony, share with me. I love you. And I know that you will also testify of the goodness of the grace of God in the name of Jesus Christ. The Lord will be with you and bless and prosper your ways. Listen, God is good and kind to you. Have a beautiful, beautiful day. If you want to talk to me, I'm going to ask. If you want to, I have one or two minutes. I can have, especially if all of you that, you know, have been trying to reach me from outside the country because of time, you can reach me. You know, thank you, Bukola. Thank you. You know, um, just j- just say hello. I'm going to cut the call. And, uh, you know, if you want to have some time with me, just send a message. We can fix a Zoom call. I can't promise it to be immediate. It can take some time, but we can do it gradually. Thank you. God bless you. If you have a testimony, send your testimonies.